Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hanson. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. If you're the kind of person who listens to a podcast like ours, my guess is that you're more likely than average to get pulled into a impromptu helping role with your family and friends. This can range from being asked your advice about a friend's relationship to answering some questions related to mental health to maybe just being a shoulder to cry on. And healthy relationships absolutely include offering our emotional support and attentive listening when it's requested and appropriate. So this is all really normal. But sometimes what happens is we find ourselves getting sucked into relationships where this helping role begins to feel a bit more uncomfortable or one-sided. Maybe a friend's unhealthy relationship is starting to spiral to a place where you're functioning as their impromptu therapist or serving as a regular mediator between the parties. And maybe you even start to feel like you've gotten sucked into playing a kind of role in someone else's play that you never really wanted in the first place. Today, we're going to be focusing on how we can handle situations like this, including getting better at recognizing when you've gotten pulled into one of these systems, how to navigate them carefully, and how to get yourself out. And along the way, we'll explore some ideas from psychology that have been really, really useful for me personally, even as a non-clinician. And I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I love this topic. And I anticipate, actually, having a moment or two where I'm kind of startled and forced to look at myself, including in terms mm. of the parenting role. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I love this. I mean, that's a, I don't know where you're going with this, Dad. It's its not in my kind of demo notes for the convo, so you might take me by surprise a little bit here, which is, uh, is I think, always at the very least enjoyable for the listeners, if not always for me, but I'll try my best to stay on my toes here. But before we get started, I do want to give people a couple of quick reminders. So first, Please subscribe to the podcast if you're listening to it and you haven't done that yet because that really helps us out. And then second, if you prefer watching video, you can find my channel on YouTube where we post all of the episodes. And then finally, if you'd like to support us in other ways, we have a Patreon account. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a few dollars a month, you can receive expanded show notes that I put together that explore the episodes in more detail, transcripts, and ad-free versions of all of the episodes. So, Dad, I'd like to start with a fairly common situation where a person feels like they're starting to serve as a casual therapist to their friend. What do you just think about that in general? I think that it's a slippery slope, and mm. <clears throat> it's useful to distinguish between having a conversation with someone that is therapeutic mm. in the broad sense of healing, soothing, giving them their room, their space, their air. I think that's mm. that's fine. We, we do that. To start moving into taking responsibility for mm. a mental health condition, a medical condition, which is the fundamental framework of doing psychotherapy with a license, that's a different kind of thing. It, in other words, it's one thing to listen to your friend talk about their aches and pains or their concern about a medical issue they're dealing with and to kind of unpack it with them in a supportive way and maybe share your own experience or push back on some advice they got from some doctor that just doesn't sound right. Uh, there's a place for that. But when you start getting in the weeds of recommending particular surgical procedures or <laughs> telling people to stop taking that antidepressant, it's crazy. Yeah. You need to mm. use green, blue algae. That's the ticket with some <laughs> spirulina honey on the side. You know, that's when we start to move out of a proper domain for ourselves. The last thing yeah. I'd just say is that there's the dimension of power. There's mm. always mm -hmm. the dimension of power in our relationships. Sometimes the dimension of power is equal power uh, or power is not particularly relevant, so it's set aside, but there is power. And when we start moving into the role of becoming the knower, the helper, the healthier one, the one who's farther along the path, the one who's dialed into the real guru, you know, <laughs> then suddenly we're in trouble yeah, with other people. Totally. 
And so you have all of the clinical knowledge that somebody would need to have to serve as a therapist because you were for years and years and years and you still practice. Why wouldn't you serve as a friend's mm. therapist? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, first, yeah. I don't have all the knowledge. I, I have maybe enough knowledge to pass sure, the licensing sure. exam. And <laughs> yeah, hopefully yeah. not hurt too many people. But um, <laughs> And other people have more knowledge than I do in certain areas. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> well, because for me, there's a boundary crossing there. And mm. I, I laugh to myself sometimes. If Imagine you're at some kind of a party or you're meeting some new people and you're just chatting with different people. And then you finally get around to asking the other person, so what kind of work do you do? And there are three kinds of people that I've just seen this again and again, when suddenly the person who's been speaking rewinds everything they've said, like rut row. Number one, someone in law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> number two, a religious professional, a rabbi, a mm, minister, a priest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And number three, a therapist. So yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, yeah. And for me, and people ask me routinely, uh, you know, you, you, you must, uh, you know, get tired of being a therapist to people in general. I'm crystal clear. I just don't load those modules into my mm -hmm. inner operating system unless I'm in that frame of professional therapy. Now, mm -hmm. I can't help b b to bring to bear uh, what I know. It's just like sure. someone maybe who uh, is a medical professional would bring to bear an awareness of a person who's coughing spasmodically next to them, standing in line, uh, sure, yeah. waiting for a ticket somewhere. And, and you need to bring to bear, but you don't step into that role without the consent. There's something really sacred about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you want to have appropriate boundaries with people. Yeah. And also one of the key features of going to a therapist, which I haven't been a therapist, but I've gone to a couple of them over the course of my life, yeah. is that you're outside of the systems that the other person is a part of. Yeah. So you can kind of see them objectively. And so it's really different if you're somebody's like good friend and they're talking to you about a partner, you know that partner, you really can't maintain your objectivity about the situation. Uh, because you're implicated by it. Maybe you know the person, maybe you have a relationship with them yourself. Even if you don't know them, maybe you have views about them based off of what other people have told you about them, whatever it is. So you can see how these kinds of impromptu helping situations that people can get sucked into uh, can be really complicated to navigate. I, over the years, developed, like many longtime therapists do, a increasingly lengthy form for people mm. to read and sign when they first come into the practice, partly mm. just to lay out policies, procedures, and so forth, and also to describe a general approach. One of the things I put in there is that first, good therapy ends. Mm. Good therapy comes to an end. Now, there may be an intermittent usage, as it sometimes happens. People I've seen eight years ago will swing back to me for one or two or three sort of catch-up sessions about something that's emerged for them, but good therapy ends. And second, I make it really clear in those forms that I will not be your friend. Mm. I will be friendly, but I we will not become friends. And some people are really put off by that or hurt by that, or they're puzzled by that initially. And yet it's actually in the service of them that we're not gonna move into that kind of dual relationship um, long-term. And there are a lot of ethical issues that have to do with becoming friends. Now, people might draw that line a little differently. I tend to be pretty strict and clear about it um, because I think that it's important to realize, I've had people actually say, oh, I want you to like me. And I say, well, I do like you as a being. And I would highly recommend don't go to a therapist who just doesn't like you very much or even mm -hmm. dislikes you then yeah. it's troublesome. But I said, more important than whether I like you is whether I'm committed to you as mm. a professional who's taking responsibility for your care. Because liking comes and goes, right? Uh, and if you like me today, will you like me tomorrow? And it puts clients in this weird position of them performing to get their therapist Yeah, I just approval. wanted to say something about that because I, for me in... The therapy that I've done, and particularly I, uh, I saw one therapist for a fairly extended period of time, and I cultivated a really good positive relationship with him. And what I noticed by the time that we got to the fifth or sixth session, I started to kind of 
not fully censor myself, but censor myself a little bit because I wanted him to like me. So yeah. there were things that I, I wasn't putting out in the space that I felt uncomfortable about inside of myself because I wanted to preserve that kind of a relationship. And it was actually really kind of tough to bring that material up. And I, I had to do some inner reorganizing to get comfortable with the idea of like me saying something that maybe would lead to this person who I myself liked and respected, like l thinking of me in a less positive way. Yeah. Have you bumped into that at all? Oh, yeah. And yeah. again, it's very human mm -hmm. and it can totally. become an impediment to, to yeah. progress. And, you know, affections, liking, is unreliable. It rises mm -hmm. and falls. You can you can't really count on it necessarily. Or if you can count on it, it's often because there's a performative pressure on you to elicit that liking continuously. But what you can count on is professionalism, <laughs> skillfulness, dedication, yeah, duty, totally commitment. That's what you can count on. It may seem mm. counterintuitive that in such an intimate and emotional setting that what really makes it work well is more austere and impersonal. Mm. I'm a serious professional and I bring that professionalism to every single appointment. And you can count on that. So I wanna use this conversation that we're having right now about therapy and being a therapist and why it's, it's helpful to uh, stay very clearly in that professional role rather than to get sucked into that kind of dual relationship. And alongside that, some of the pitfalls that people can fall into when they start to serve as a more impromptu, casual helper to the people around them. As a way in to talking about the roles that we play in general and the ways in which our life is affected by the roles that we step into. Um, because being a therapist is a kind of role, right? As you mentioned earlier, there's a sort of power dynamic between the therapist and the client a lot of the time. The therapist is the one who knows. They're this supportive and helpful individual. And they exist as a role because there is somebody else in the room with them, right? I mean, yeah. you continue to be a therapist when you're not actively seeing a client, but the role of therapist gets activated when you are sitting in front of another person. Mm -hmm. And with all of these roles that we have, there are these kinds of like images and scripts that get activated by them, right? And one of the most powerful things that I've ever practiced with or learned is to get a little closer to seeing the ways in which we carry all these models of the world around with us and the ways in which our behavior is deeply affected by the scripts that are associated mm. with these models. So are you kind of following where I'm going so far here, Dad? Oh, 100%. You're totally Great. on it. Yeah, social knowledge awesome. is represented in script-like sequences. Which is totally wild if you kind of yeah. think about it, right? And so this thing starts to happen in our lives where we often find ourselves being placed in uh, consistent roles in the play of our lives. We ourselves get used to playing a certain kind of role. Mm -hmm. uh, one example of this, like a common role that I certainly played when I was a young person was the golden child role, right? <laughs> My parents loved me. I was the firstborn kid. I was the center of attention. And I brought all these laughs and spontaneity and joy to those around me, at least in my imagination I did. And along the way, I probably like broke a couple of plates and upset the apple cart once or twice and so on. <laughs> And alongside that, I received 95% praise, and I loved it, and I lapped it up. Or sorry, 99. <laughs> oh, 99% praise. Great, even better, even better. It was lapped even it worse. up, 99% praise, 99%. Uh -huh. And I received 1% criticism, and that 1% was the worst. It was the worst. The golden child sunsetted behind the hills, oh, no. right into the it's dark true. place. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and yeah. so and but you see that pattern in a lot of people, right? Yeah. Um, like that's a certain kind of role. So what mm. do I need to play that role? Well, I need a responsible parent around me, right? I need somebody who appreciates and loves the child, but also creates the comfortable and safe environment that mm. I play in. Yeah. So this is a certain kind of model, it's a certain kind of scheme. Uh it I would say reflects our relationship, which is part of the reason that I'm using it as an example here. Yeah. 
But it's mostly a way in to thinking about what these kinds of roles are that we play in our lives and what are the roles that other people play for us and then what are the roles that other people try to suck us into playing inside of their psychodrama. You know, I'm thinking out loud here in terms of the, yeah, the topic about mm-hmm. with other people. It's really interesting to see a dynamic that starts out, it feels balanced and reciprocal, person A, person mm-hmm. B. Mm-hmm. So person A listens to B as much as B listens to A. Uh, person A asks for support, for help from B as much as B asks for A. They each offer roughly the same amount. There's a loose reciprocity to that. And it may cross domains. Like for example, I have I have a friend um, who has taught me a ton about nature uh, and mm-hmm. rock climbing. And from time to time, he'll invite me into talking with him about his relationships and his struggles mm. there. But there's a there's a loose reciprocity. We're clear about it. Neither of us lets it go too far. But then sometimes it gets in it gets imbalanced, doesn't it? We we find ourselves getting into trouble uh, in some situations where on the one hand, maybe another person really just wants to keep moving into the teacher role. Mm-hmm. You tell him, you know, you were driving your car and this person was next to you and they they got aggressive, they moved into your lane too quickly and you were scared and angry and you're just sharing your experience. But suddenly they want to give you advice or they want to, you know, take you back to your how your mom or dad taught you how to drive a car and the trauma of your history there. And it's not quite right, you know, what? Or flip the other way, a person who keeps trying to move into the position of being the helpy, the one who needs help and drawing you into being nurturing and listening and and commiserating with the occasional advice, which they never take <laughs> often. Uh, and then you can feel, so I guess that's what we're really talking about. Yeah, we're not, totally. We're, we're saying, yeah, there's a place and, and there are rhythms, it's cool, but when does it start to feel imbalanced? What's going on when it tips out of that more balanced reciprocity uh, totally. and, uh, and equal power uh, over time? Yeah, and for me, part of it is about like active choice versus passive choice, which I know is like classic forest here where all of a sudden you slide into an agency conversation. Like, are you doing these things because you want to be doing them or are you doing them because you're almost pre-programmed into them? And so I'll use myself again as an example here. Um, So a little while ago, I was thinking about the role that I fulfilled inside of my friend group. And I'm often the planner from my friend group. I'm the person who dots the I's and crosses the T's about when we're gonna get a group of people together. I invite the people, I figure out what we're gonna do, I figure out the time, I coordinate the schedules, I do all of that stuff. And I was starting to get a little ornery about the amount of effort that my friend group was forcing me to go through in order to do all of this planning, to create Mm -hmm. these kinds of great social environments. I I was getting frumpy about it, I was getting irritable about it, okay? And so I took a step back and I took a look at it and I went, Forrest, is anybody making you do this? And the Mm. answer is absolutely no. I was putting myself into a role. And then so I need to look at, okay, what do I get out of this role? I get control. I Mm. become the decider. And so me as a softly anxiety prone person, I like knowing when the thing's going to start. I Mm. like knowing what we're doing. And if I give that up to somebody else, I need to be comfortable with uncertainty. And that wasn't a role that I wanted to put myself in. So I kept placing myself into a position in the group that then everybody responded to, like very naturally and understandably, mm-hmm. by repeatedly putting me into that role because I performed that role well, because I'm very practiced in that role. But then you got to ask yourself, is that actually the role that you want to be playing in the play? Or is there some other role that you want, but you're not climbing for whatever reason? I think about Dune. And the Sardaukar. Oh, okay. All the right. emperor's yeah. Yeah. warriors. Yeah, all right. Okay. Who never lost a battle until they met Paul Muad'Dib on the desert planet Iraqis. And I hope those of you who have actually read the book are thoroughly <laughs> geeking out here. For those of you who aren't, you could just get the idea of the ways in which. Uh, or those who have seen the recent movie, you know, where re- Dune's back in the pop culture right now, Dad. Oh, your your 40-year-old reference is like right <laughs> spicy new right That's now. Right. I love this. Especially the second of the two parts, I guess, or whatever, that you're going to really see it. But basically, the point made in the book was that the Sardaukar did not know how to lose. 
they were captured by their strengths. And and as he beats them in the end, sorry to give it away, but basically <laughs> there's spoilers. kind of a happy ending. Uh, you know, Paul thinks to himself, you know, I need to build in a lesson for my own legions in the future that they know how to lose. Mm -hmm. right? And they, they, they're not just broken apart when they, when they hit a difficulty. In that kind of way, that's an example, I know I'm being a little bizarre here, about how we can become captured by our strengths. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of my role, uh, I grew up in a family that was pretty constricted emotionally. Um, and I, by my nature, am, can easily become fairly quiet and observant and watchful. And so I kind of went up into my head. My feelings were painful. I became very intellectual and I had a hard time coming down into my body and into my heart and my, my feelings. And that was a way for me to be. It was a role identity, intellectual, the brainy person. Um, and that's a kind of role. We can get captured by intellect. You know, I have a lot of strengths about sort of analytic, objective, um, you know, clarity. And those are useful in certain conditions, but they can become our go-to. We become a little mm. bit like Popeye, the cartoon character, and who has, what, a, gi a gigantic bicep and a skinny yeah. forearm? I don't know, mm -hmm. but... And yeah, I suddenly, think something like that. Or if you have the world's best ha hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so it's really interesting to ask how we can become captured by our strengths because our liabilities, our weaknesses, we, we know those better. We know those <laughs> better. People tell us about them, darn them, <laughs> <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But our strengths, people love our strengths. Yeah. We get rewarded for mm. our strengths and we mm. develop them further. And therefore, it's especially important to be careful about that kind of thing. Yeah, so there are a couple of ideas from psychology that were just super impactful for me when I learned about them, and they really changed how I viewed these roles broadly, and also just like really affected how I looked at social interactions. Like sometimes when you learn this stuff, you could just look across a room and just see it so differently. Uh, and those two words are enactments and triangulation. And I was wondering if you could just take a second to explain those to people. Well, I'm so glad you did it. Um, and you're going to add to my explanation, I'm sure. So an enactment is essentially what it sounds like. We are playing a role that's familiar to us. And for example, building on what I said a second ago, if you are comfortable with being smart and analytic and you know the one who knows, uh, you might routinely play that role and be cast into that role by other people. There are other enactments as well that have to do with larger systems, and we're going to get into that in a second. In other words, if another person, like an authority figure, mm -hmm. I was talking with someone just the other day uh, who is rebellious toward authority figures. So she's normally really quite relaxed, quite mellow, and so forth, but if she encounters someone who's telling her what to do with more power, she resists intensely. One of the problems, mm -hmm. though, with being captured by that is she can't tell herself what to do because she rebels against the part of her oh, that knows with- The inner knowing. That knows with clarity that it would really serve her to follow kind of a daily program of a loose yeah. sort, but pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. You know, she rebels at the very idea of establishing a daily program for herself that she knows would be really helpful. Because even though she's the creator of the directive, the command, it still is an automatic, unconscious, reactive habit of rebelling against commands, even when she's the source of them. So they can, you know, in other words, what gets enacted is socially situated. It depends on what's sort of happening in different situations. So maybe I'll just pause there before we get to triangulation. Yeah, I'll, I'll toss one or two think. additional things in there, yeah. might as well, where um, when I was doing a little bit of additional, just like reading about it, because I knew the basic idea and I needed to learn a little bit more in order to talk about it on this episode, um, is that in psychoanalytics in particular, enactments are often framed as being based off of the relationship with the therapist but we can kind of broaden it out in the way in which you're doing here, dad, where like the classic example of this might be uh, in, in like a very Freudian sense with all of its 
various issues associated with it. Uh, you know, the idea that a lot of our relationships are driven by the relationships that we have with our mother and our father when we're very, very young, and we kind of constantly reenact them mm -hmm. in our future relationships. So you might have a situation in therapy where a client comes into the room and after loosening up for a while, and I'm curious if this has ever happened to you, by the way, Dad, um, all of a sudden they start to kind of almost turn the therapist into positions where they inhabit a similar relationship to maybe the way that they were with their dad or with their mother when they were a lot younger. And they start to reenact that relationship. And that then becomes an opportunity potentially to have some new learning take place where the therapist can either draw attention to it or can help things play out a little bit differently in the here and now than they did back then or other things kind of like that. Is that more or less accurate, Dad? And also, did that ever happen to you? Yes and yes. And okay. it's <laughs> um, hopefully in the service of something helpful where a therapy can <clears throat> stall out and to the point that the best you, you can do is terminate it and maybe refer the person to someone else is where you just, you can't, you plural, you, for whatever reason, you're in a log jam. You just cannot mm. get out, uh, get, get out of that particular script. And mm, you or, can't break out of the enactment or the yeah, script or, or the something roles. happens. Yeah. That's just um, just so devastating that mm. the client is just, they're done. Yeah. For example, in the enactments from childhood, there's a very helpful psychoanalytic term called splitting. Splitting is this idea that uh, children, really young, young, young children, have a hard time with ambiguity. So it's either all good or all bad, right? Mm -hmm. All left or all right. Whereas as their cognitive capabilities develop through the transition roughly to age three to five, there's a major cognitive revolution there. And then there's a five to seven shift it's called where they become more and more abstract. They can see more complexity, including seeing complexity in other people. But really young children, it's sort of like good mommy, bad mommy. Yeah. It's not like one mommy who's mm -hmm. nice most of the time, but when she's mad at daddy, she's kind of irritated with people mm -hmm. in general, understandably. So uh, what can happen then is that as a therapist, you start out, you're the good. You're the good yeah. parent, good yeah. parent, good parent, good parent. And you're put in that role, which is, um, and again, experienced therapists are become quite aware of the feeling of that, the smell of it. Mm -hmm. And they do little things to try to normalize it, to get off that pedestal. Cause you know, when you get put on that pedestal, that's just a prelude to a fall. That mm -hmm. fall mm -hmm. may happen a year or 10 later, but it's pretty inevitable that it's gonna happen. So mm -hmm. you wanna get off that pedestal as fast as you can. That said, maybe they start out, good therapist, good therapist, and so forth. By the way, people can think about this in their dating life. I was just gonna say that it, it's, ther the, yeah. the therapeutic container is a very like clear microcosm of this, but you could really broaden this. Totally. That's exactly right. The world in a grain yeah. of sand. So good person, good person, good therapist, good therapist, good daddy, I'm a male, you know, I have paternal qualities you may yeah. have noticed, right? So forth. <laughs> and then something happens. Something yeah. happens. Maybe you use a word that's helpful, but to them lands as critical. Or maybe they watch you, you're a little inattentive. Or maybe you have a cold, or you're a little sick, or you're a little sleepy, and you're not as present as normally you would be. And they interpret that as, as that you don't, that the client no longer matters to the therapist, that you don't care. And suddenly, boom, you are in a totally different movie. Mm -hmm. There's like the good other movie, and then there's the bad other movie. And sure. then there's the who is the self in each of those movies. Because in object mm -hmm. relations, you know, the sense of self is linked to, coupled to the other. If daddy or the therapist suddenly seems cool, distancing, critical, bad daddy, scary daddy, and then who's the self in relationship to, bound to, bad daddy, scary daddy. Well, the self then could be both frozen, let's say, and or the self could get very angry and yeah. raging, uh, including a demanding ragefulness. And suddenly in the, in the room, 
you've gone from everything's fine to a state change. That's splitting. Mm. That's splitting. Mm -hmm. It's not subtle. I mean, you know, there's there's subtle differences. People can talk about it. They can bring it together. They can remember that you're the good therapist, even though that word was unskillful that the therapist mm -hmm. used and it landed badly. And you can process that. And as you said, have a corrective emotional experience about it. But if someone's wounding is very young and structural, then there's a tendency towards splitting, which then over time you try to heal. But yeah, sometimes if you get cast into that bad daddy, bad therapist role as an enactment by the other, it's too late, you can't get out. So I do want to get to triangulation at some point, but I want to spend a little bit more time with this idea because I think it's such a, a big oh, one. Man. And we talked about it a little bit during our conversation about borderline tendencies. Mm -hmm. We're splitting is correct me if I'm wrong here, but my yeah. understanding is that it's a major feature of people who have more borderline tendencies um, to different degrees. And some people can have this more mildly and some people can have it in, in more severe ways like the ones that you're describing. Yeah. You mentioned a second ago developing kind of a radar for when this is going mm -hmm. on. And I would imagine it's, it's probably particularly clear in therapy, but I've certainly had times in my life where it felt like maybe a friend or maybe it's often even somebody you don't know even quite that well, but like a friend is putting you into a certain kind of role and you don't really know how they started positioning you this way. And it's just starting to feel kind of uncomfortable. Have you ever been in a situation like that? And what is that radar that you're sort of describing, that attentiveness to when you're getting placed into that enactment? In um, the therapy setting, you're supposed to be on the lookout for it. You're, you're attentive to these dynamics. And I think it's important to be clear about the frame. This is normal. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're not ready for this stuff, it's like if you're a physician, if you're not ready for illness, and if you're not ready for bleeding, <laughs> you're sure. in the wrong profession. Yeah, you know? totally, totally. Yeah, it's, it's okay. And people become this way for reasons. And this is a way that the mind and brain has evolved to be adaptive. And, and it's because people were wounded. In general, if you think of it, the degree of the intensity of casting others into a particular role is in proportion to the narcissism of the screenwriter and director of the other person. Because to cast- I am, all right. <laughs> that was, that. all right, that, that was cool, Dad. I like that. Okay, keep going. <laughs> well, if you think of it, it's, yeah. a, it's a kind yeah. of dehumanization of the full mosaic, mm. the full complexity, mm. the full package of the other to, in effect, insist in various ways that they be a certain way with you. And the more a person is self-absorbed, even to the point of being clinically narcissistic, the more they're gonna basically want others to be extensions of uh, the fulfillment of their needs. Wow, And I didn't think about this, but that's super true. That's really interesting. Yeah, and so you start to feel it. So that's one of the, the radar. So what's the radar? You start to feel itted in a subtle way, in a certain kind of way, by another person. They're, they don't see the full you. Uh, you know, I, it, it is a term I use, you're familiar with it, from Martin Buber's work, uh, three kinds of relationship, I and thou, I and it, it and it. When you start to feel like you're an it to their I, huh, you know, that's kind of a giveaway a little bit. You start to feel like you're an extension of them. Everything's cool as long as you uh, see it their way. That's, a, that's another thing, by the way, that's a giveaway for narcissism. It's the demand for like-mindedness. You know, your view as the narcissistic person is their view, you know, the, and so forth. And so you start to feel like they can't let, they can't let you move out of the box. They're uncomfortable with shifting the roles. Um, they like you as long as, right? Those are giveaways for me. Uh, it starts to feel kind of controlling. Sometimes, the enactments that people put us in are pretty subtle. They're very normal range. What do you think about all this? I was talking with Dr. Craig Malkin about narcissism on the on the podcast semi recently, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed the way that he talked about narcissistic tendencies as mm -hmm. them being, you know, on a spectrum. We all have a certain amount of narcissism, yeah. quote unquote, inside of us. And then the question is, is it a healthy amount or not? Um, but associating this, like pulling other people into our stories or our scripts as being associated with like a, a drive to feel special 
that we have or a drive to center ourselves in that kind of narcissistic way. I'd never really heard it put that way. And I think that's really interesting. Oh, that's good. Now, I want to be really clear, too, because when we're hurting, we want help. It's normal. And it's normal to really like it when someone listens to you. What a concept. Totally. Yeah. You know, you haven't yeah. had that experience. Uh, and um, it's normal if you're worried about something. Yeah. To, to pull for, you know, maybe some problem solving or, okay, good. What's really important is if we're asking others to perform a certain role for us at the time to take their needs into account as well and mm -hmm. be prepared to see them as a whole person, yeah. even as you're asking for a particular kind of, of support. Yeah. Well, now that we've done this, I suspect that we could do like a whole podcast episode on enactments, which was not what I expected us to like spend a lot of time with here, but it is really fascinating stuff. But I do want to also get to talking about triangulation yeah. a little bit, which totally changed how I just like viewed social interactions with other people. Would you mind letting people know about that? Okay. And I happen to know that you've thought this through pretty deeply, you know, from seeing. Yeah, I, I love triangulation, but, you know, yeah. let's, I'll start with the clinical and then I'll, I'll go to the, the, I don't know, the recreational on my side of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, you know, that term tends to get stretched and applied in different ways. Uh, kind of the classic triangle uh, is the Oedipal triangle, right? Mm, Psychoanalytic mm -hmm. theory. So you have, let's just talk about Freud his life, Sigmund Freud, baby, baby Sigmund, grows up. His mom is closer in age to him than she is to her husband. She married a much older man in the Victorian culture of sort of upper middle class Vienna. So for Freud, you know, he was the beloved child. He was the golden child. And he and his mom formed a really strong alliance to some against to some extent, against his father. And Freud had a fantasy life that was probably somewhat eroticized with his own mother. She did not abuse him or molest him and so forth. It was kind of in his own mind, but there's that strong alliance against the father for whom he had certain destructive fantasies. And, you know, he talked about this and then he projected onto others and universalized his own particular uh, circumstances, which involve themes that might have some generality to them, such as going all the way back to the, you know, Oedipal myth, uh, you know, from Greece and the play written by Sophocles, uh, in which Oedipus eventually kills his father and marries his mother. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's a kind of triangulation uh, in, in, you know, you form these alliances, uh, you see it in playgrounds. One of the things that happens in therapy is when you see a couple. Yeah, I was just gonna point to this. It's like classic triangle, yeah. Yeah, and it's really interesting. So usually couples come in the door and there's a plaintiff and a defendant. There's someone who has a list and there's someone who not um, often because they want to be there is kind of pulled into the psychotherapy. All right, so what do you do as a therapist? If you highly join with the plaintiff, the one who has the grievances, let's say there's, you know, there's a legitimacy in the plaintiff. They're not making it up. There's real stuff. There are real needs that are unmet. There are real issues or real behaviors. So you're trying to help that get better, which means influencing the defendant in some ways over time, but you lose your capacity to do that if you're perceived as, you know, joining with the complainant. On the other hand, mm -hmm. if you deliberately correct for that, which sometimes is um, strategically wise to de deploy that tactic in a sense of particularly making room for the defendant who's the, who is the bottleneck of progress because they're the person least committed to the therapy. So they have the most power in the room because they're the person mm. who's most willing to walk out the door. And I've had mm. people walk out the door um, or just refuse to come back. So you're, you're taking that into account, but then suddenly, you're joining with the the bad guy. You're you're joining with the person who's doing the wrong stuff to the plaintiff, and mm -hmm. then you throw in gender sometimes, if as is commonly the case, you know, in a heterosexual relationship, it's the woman who's 
dragging the husband or boyfriend or partner in that frame uh, into the therapy. And if I, as a male therapist then, am seen to overjoin with the male defendant, mm. then suddenly it's two guys ganging up yet again in history, mm. you know, on the woman who um, has a very understandable grievances and important unmet needs. So it's so you I'm want just, to balance that. Yeah, you have to walk yeah. it through. And I hope it's okay for me to go mm -hmm. into the detail of it because it makes it really yeah. concrete. Great, yeah. So the the theory of it, to do a little bit on theory here, just so we all know what we're talking about, um, comes from something that's called family systems theory, which views the family as an emotional unit where each member plays a specific role, like we're talking about today, and has to follow certain rules based on the roles that they play. And the relationships in the system and the patterns that are created out of them are built from triangles. That's why it's called triangulation, which are three-person units. Um, and the basic idea of it is that a two-person unit is not a stable system. Uh, it's unstable because it has it can't tolerate much um, much stress, much interpersonal strain before it breaks or before it looks for a third person to incorporate to stabilize the relationship. And one of the interesting things about this theory, the part of it that I attach to the most, is the idea that these triangles always create power relationships between the three people who are involved. Or you could think about a common situation inside of a, of a family system like us growing up, where it was just me, you, and mom. I would imagine that, you know, Forrest does something problematic or whatever. Okay, the parents are allied against the problematic behavior of the child. Forrest, you need to do your dishes. Forrest, you need to pick up your toys. Whatever it is that Forrest needs to do. Okay, and then let's say, theoretically, that mom and dad get into some kind of tiff with each other, right? They, some kind of an argument, a little disruption of rapport in the relationship. All of a sudden, one of you goes to the child and seeks the child for comfort. And in some less healthy family systems, might start to vent about the other parent to the child. If you're listening and this happened to you, no worries, you are not alone. This is extremely common, even though it is a bit problematic. Um, and then all of a sudden, the, the triangle has shifted. And what you see is you see these shifting allyships and relationships inside of these triangle systems because over time, some disruption of rapport will inevitably happen between the members of the strong part of the triangle. And then one of them ha has to reach out to the weaker member of the triangle to become a new ally with. And triangulation just describes how that process happens. And it is absolutely fascinating to think about your relationships this way. <laughs> At least for me. Yeah, yeah. And what's sort of healthy triangulation and what's not, mm, you know, there's mm -hmm. generally a lot of research that, that suggests that if there's a family system, the parenting couple is a really important bond. Yeah. And when that bond is weak or con conflicted, that tends to disrupt the family system as a whole in ways that are not good for the children. There would be times when you were little, when mom and I would be hugging, you know, in the living room or something, and you would want to, you would try to worm your way between us. Oh, I'm sure. This and I think it was more like yeah. you wanted a sandwich. Yeah, totally. Sandwich. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to be involved. Yeah, yeah. You, you're the golden child. You know, you want, <laughs> absolutely. I want <laughs> you, to be in the middle. Hello. You wanted to be in the love bubble. It was all good. <laughs> it was all good. I've seen situations like that where basically it's the child is trying to drive a wedge. Yeah, and again, it's become, evil, become the strong part of the relationship, right? totally. But it's sort of, hmm, you know, and it's, it's important for parents to appreciate the value of strengthening their own bond. It doesn't mean putting up with bad behavior in the other parent, including bad behavior toward the kids, just to maintain that bond. But there's, some, there's a value in that bond. So I guess I'll just say that there are certain kinds of bonds, you know, that are particularly appropriate in the triangle. Yeah, totally. And one of the ways for me that triangulation becomes really important for this conversation is exactly how you're describing that. Because often what happens in unhealthier relationships is that they look for other parties to triangulate with yeah. in a variety of different ways. And I mean, if you're listening, you've probably had friends who have done this at some point. Uh, you have a good friend who's in a relationship with somebody that's a little bit dysfunctional, 
and this friend is constantly trying to include you for by reaching out for for emotional support or by uh, occasionally going to things with you and this other person where they do a lot of like connecting with you and kind of allying against the third member and all of these little kinds of ways. And you might have experiences where these allyships shift in different ways over time. I've definitely experienced this myself. Um, and it's a way that in which people can really get sucked into these dysfunctional and unhealthy relational systems because they triangulate out for a third member to to stabilize the relationship. Yeah, where you start to notice it is in friend groups. So sure. you've you've got your new friend group and A, B, and C. You're A. Mm -hmm. And B calls you up and wants to complain about C. Yep. What do you do? What do you do? And it's tough because sometimes there's a place for people to kind of air things about mutual friends. There's a place for that. But when does that start to become gossipy and you start to feel like this C is calling you up about B because they want you to fix B or they want you to ally with them to fix B because yeah. <laughs> B is the problem. And yeah. you start to realize after a while that C also is doing that because they don't want to talk to B. They're scared of B. They don't want to be the one to deliver the communication. They yeah, don't want to totally. get the heat with B. It's like really awkward. They just, I'm going to use a really loaded word. Ready? They just want to whine about it. So then what do you do? And it gets really interesting. Also, what do you do if you have a partner or a friend who's dealing with the medical system and they come, they keep coming back from these appointments complaining about the doctor? or the fill in the bank blank medical professional. And you, you, and you just say, well, can you tell them? Can you tell the, the nurses? Can you write them a letter? Can you talk to your doctor the next time you meet? And then you start to wonder after a while, am I serving a function? That's always the question. What's the function? By being a nice listener, am I serving a function that lets my friend off the hook of actually standing tall and taking care of their problem themselves. Elizabeth said something the other day. Elizabeth is my girlfriend. She's currently in her uh, associateship training to be a, uh, a clinician, a therapist. And um, she had a comment the other day offhandedly that just like really kind of stuck with me as she does sometimes. It was, most people don't want you to fix their problem. They want somebody to finally listen to you and be on their side. Yeah, good wisdom. You know, like sometimes people are reaching out because they want you to fix their problem, but a lot of the time they just want you to listen to them in a thoughtful way, yeah. extend a compassionate ear and all of that kind of good stuff. But sometimes they actually do need to fix their problem, kind yeah. of like you're describing, Dad. They're having this issue that's like an, an important medical issue with a doctor, and they'd really yeah. be served by talking to a different doctor or whatever. Yeah. And they're using you as a kind of a proxy that forestalls their individual movement inside of this relationship because they keep on slapping a Band-Aid of yeah. your emotional succor over this like gaping hole. Yeah. And maybe if you went, hey, I just don't want to fulfill this role for you anymore, that would actually give them the kick in the pants that's necessary to do something about their underlying problem. That's totally right. And uh, I think it, it's also important to appreciate that, as I try to myself, that it's easy for me to be assertive with authority figures because I'm an authority figure totally. and I'm late stage career. I don't know if you can quote me. I don't have that many more shits to give in effect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's staying in the episode, Dad. You better believe that's staying in. I'm not taking that out. That's fantastic. Sorry. Well, it's also, also true. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a white male, uh, yeah. you know, professional class person with a you're very PhD protected, D, totally, and a reputation, and so there's a certain clout, and I want to I want to acknowledge that. So that too mm -hmm. is important when we're with someone who's in a sense triangulating us, because. Mm -hmm understandably maybe it's harder be looking for, for allyship absolutely yeah it's harder for them to to speak up and stand up than it is for totally. you and you know it's really 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 important to take into account i 
think both can be true. And here's where I'm probably going to maybe be a little curmudgeonly, and I don't know, <laughs> but, which is, uh, on the one hand, there's just no replacement for deep listening mm. and giving giving each other that. My favorite therapist is Carl Carl Rogers. I think the most pervasively brilliant therapist of the 20th century was Carl Jung. Mm. Brilliant. But I'd rather go see Carl Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'd get more out of it. I, yeah, right there with you. you know, yeah, the profundity of his listening. Actually, can I tell you a Carl Rogers story? Yeah, please, story? go ahead. This is secondhand. Someone told it to me who was uh, a teacher of mine at UCLA in an early counseling cl class I took. And this person knew Carl Rogers as a young therapist himself uh, toward the very, very end of Rogers' career. So uh, Rogers came to a meeting in which my teacher was present as a young grad student. Very cool. Early therapist with maybe 20 people sitting around a table. And Rogers comes in, he sits down and he says, well, it's really nice to meet you. Please tell me about yourselves. And so he sits there quietly completely attentively, while 20 people, one after the other, go around the table and talk with him from the heart about their personal struggles, mm -hmm. their longings, what they're dealing with, just goes around. And then when it's all done, he goes around the circle one by one with perfect recollection and, re and in reception. He received them in a mm -hmm. deep listening kind of way. and with responsive listening to each single one of them going around the table. It was a profound demonstration of the humility to be so thoroughly present for other people. Mm. Doesn't mean you'd have to agree with them, you don't let them abuse you, but you can really show up. So to Elizabeth's comment there, that is certainly what many people long for because they haven't gotten much of it. And it's a great yeah. gift we can give to each other. Yeah. Totally. On the one hand. Yep. On the other hand, the older I get, the more compassionate I get, and the more of a butt kicker I become. <laughs> because there's no <laughs> replacement for action. For a, yeah. Just like there's no replacement. Hey, you, you don't have to tell me, man. I'm right there with <laughs> okay, you. Okay, yeah, okay. totally. And totally. again, I'm socialized to be an action guy, and I have the privilege of being able to act in ways that mm -hmm. are not immediately targeted and punished you know, by the powers that be, potentially. But still, totally. man, there's just no replacement for skillful action mm -hmm. uh, at the scale that a person can yeah. do. No pressure. Not, But at the level of a breath at a time, a breath here and there, a thought here and there, a minute here and there, that kind of level of action is very within range for everyone. And it really adds up beneficially over time. Totally agree. Couldn't agree more strongly. So we're kind of coming to the end here. Uh, I have loved this conversation. This is this is one of my personal favorites. I've just thought it was so cool. Uh, but as part of it is that these are like the kinds of topics that I just geek yeah. out on super yeah. hard. Um, and I do have a question for you that's kind of a, a practical question here. Uh -huh. For the kind of people who listen to the podcast, as I said right in the intro of the conversation, they are probably disproportionately likely True. to get sucked into these kinds of impromptu helper role, shoulder to cry on, hey, can I just ask you a question about this relationship issue I'm having with a friend sort of position. And uh, and you can sometimes, like you're, like you're describing that, kind of get a feel for mm. when you're getting pulled into a role in somebody else's shtick. Mm. you don't really want to have that role anymore. Maybe mm. it was okay for a while, but right. it started to get sort of weird. And now things are getting complicated and they're they're calling you and you don't want to be called or mm. whatever is going on. Yeah. How do you establish some healthy boundaries around it without just like ending the relationship with this person? Mm. Like, do you have any recommendations for people there? I've I've seen it. I've seen... Mm -hmm you know, different versions of this. There are different subcultures and there's gender socialization in the mix and different different styles and, you know, taking the differences into account as the context for two suggestions I have. Uh, the first often is easy to do and it's the least risky for the relationship is to start tacitly implementing a disengagement from the script. 
where, for example, you're bounding the length of conversations, mm -hmm. you're letting a person know that evenings are not good for you, and uh, you just tacitly do less and less of it, or you find yourself more and more quickly listening, and especially when it's a repetitive story, you, you start coming in a little sooner and a little more um, clearly with, with questions along the lines of, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Mm. You're not giving advice. You're not fixing, but you're turning the person to action. Often people get the message that, you know, I, I've kind of heard you've come, you know, I, I got it. I, I heard the complaint multiple times. I totally get it. It's a recurring issue for you. I care about you as a friend. I, I'm sorry to see you suffering. What do you want to do about it? What would help? Right. And that, yeah. that itself is often totally. you can get away with that. That alone can kind of do that. Uh, and the other is the other suggestion is riskier in the relationship, which is to go to the process level and comment on the process and what's mm -hmm. actually happening. And including little observations like, well, maybe starting out kind of innocently, well, I, I noticed the last you know, th three times we, you're a dear friend. The last three times we talked, you're, you're bringing up your ex, um, and you, you know, what a jerk that person is, let's say, say it's a he. And, uh, you know, I just kind of wonder, is it helping you to talk with me mm. about it? Now, sometimes what happens is the other person will say, oh my gosh, it so is. I have these other friends, they're always telling me to get a different lawyer. I, that's not helpful. You are helpful because you listen. Mm. And you go, mm. oh, okay. And then you start to make yeah. me feel better about mm -hmm. doing that role. You don't feel so uh, shoved into a strange function for this person that's actually aiding and abetting their pathologies. Mm -hmm. It's actually mm -hmm. helpful to them. Other times, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the person might be a little startled and realize, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I bent your ear too much. And then you say, no, no, I, I was happy to do it. I just kind of wondered if it was helpful. But it's, it makes the, the person who's doing the ear bending more aware of the fact that they're doing ear bending. Yeah. To go a step further, to finish, a kind of ladder of escalation here is to say to someone, well, I don't know if it's helpful for you. And I can say for myself, it's starting to feel a little one-sided. Hmm. You know, and I'm I'm wishing for for our friendship because I value you. I'd like more of your interest in my world. And I'm mm. looking for over time a kind of balance. It doesn't have to be perfectly balanced in any single conversation, but averaged over half a dozen conversations, that there's kind of a balance of who's talking and who's listening, whose topics are foregrounded topic control. Well, who's, who's determining the topics is one of the characteristics in this whole territory of enactment. In other words, mm -hmm. if the other person is uh, controlling the topic that you're supposed to attend to, and it's the same topic, or it's always their topic, that's a big yellow flag, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are just different ways of talking with someone. Then you try to see if you can negotiate. And yeah. sometimes you find you can, and sometimes you find that the other person just wants to use you in this way. And then you got to decide, do you want to be used in this way? Is yeah, it okay totally. with you? Uh, totally. Maybe they're your in-law. Maybe they're your, you know, aunt in Nebraska. And all right, that's how she uses you. And when you talk once a week, and that's okay. You don't mind it for the 40 minutes. You know, other times you think to yourself, you know, I'm reevaluating this friendship. It's too much of a one-way street. I have needs of my own. I don't need this anymore. And you kind of disengage. Awesome. And I think that there are two things that I would just pull out Please. of what you said. The first is understanding the assignment has been a profoundly useful for thing for me personally in my <laughs> life. It's really helpful for me when I know what the role is that I am performing Great. inside of an interaction. That's so good. And and sometimes people don't want to be really transparent about the role that they're putting you in. So I've actually had moments during conversations where we get three minutes into it and I go, wait a second, 
what are you wanting from me in this conversation? And I may or may not say it exactly that directly. I might say it with a little bit more like social carefulness than that. But that's basically what I'm asking. Like, what is the role that you want me to perform here? Yeah. What is doing my job as your friend yeah. well look like in yeah. this moment for you? The second thing that I really liked about what you said, Dad, is that at no point did you use any kind of psychological terminology. And <laughs> I did not notice that. <laughs> and I, I think that was really smart uh, because I think that a, a caution that I would give people here is that it is generally not useful to tell somebody, hey, you know, it feels like you're sucking me into an enactment here. <laughs> Like that is not, I, now I've never said that to somebody, but like just like little moments where you can, particularly if like, like me, you're, you're an amateur and yeah. you're coming to this territory as a thoughtful and attentive amateur, yeah. uh, be really, really cautious about using psychological language. Even uh, like my therapist friends do not talk that way with other random people when they're having normal social interactions. Uh, yeah. It immediately puts people on the back foot. It puts you in a position where it feels like you're aggrandizing yourself over them. It's technical terminology, so it's easy to misunderstand it or misuse yeah. it. It's kind of like the ways in which everyone has become like a narcissist or everyone has borderline personality yeah. disorder on like or social on media. on the spectrum. That's Everyone's the on the spectrum. Yeah. We've got to be really careful about this language because it means something. And uh, so, yeah, so that's just a second thing that I would add to this is be really careful about like overusing casually really technical language, including the stuff that we talk about on this podcast. That's fantastic, Forrest. Yeah, yeah I love this right. one. I thought this was a great one. I really enjoyed doing this with you today, Dad. I, I hope that people got a lot of value out of this. I do too, and I, I hope my re regressions <laughs> into my primary process material. <laughs> it was, <laughs> that's like one analytic terms. Yeah, I laid one on you. Uh, and with two, it was a two for regression, primary yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I hope it wasn't too disturbing. Anyway. No, I, I thought it was fantastic. And I really enjoyed today's conversation, which focused on the roles that we play in life and the roles that other people can suck us into and how we can get a little bit better at noticing those roles and actively choosing the ones that we want to play. We began today's conversation by talking about the common situation where somebody's gotten sucked into serving as a impromptu therapist for their friends. And I just asked Rick what he thought about this. And his answer was that it is both really normal and really understandable, and also a bit of a slippery slope for a variety of different reasons. The first one is that there is an implicit power dynamic that occurs in therapy, where a uh, client, somebody with a problem, goes to the one who knows, the therapist, in order to solve that problem. And when you start to create that kind of power dynamic, in a friendly relationship, it can lead to a unbalancing of the situation that can start to feel pretty uncomfortable for everybody who's involved, particularly over a long enough period of time. And then second, one of the things that's really necessary if you're going to be a therapist is to preserve your objectivity. Therapists can do what they do in part because they are not a part of the broader social or family system that a person exists in. They aren't your friend, so they can be really honest with you about what's going on. And when you're friends with somebody, you're almost always going to be at least somewhat implicated by their social system. So even if you think that you're being really objective, you're probably at least a little bit biased. And this is part of the reason that even therapists don't serve as their friend's therapist, right? They have plenty of knowledge in order to be able to do so if they could in a way that really worked, but it doesn't really work most of the time. And so that's something that clinicians are really conscious about as well. And being a therapist for somebody else is a kind of role. And so this let us talk about the various roles that we play in our lives, the roles that we put ourselves into and the roles that other people put us into. And when I was doing the planning for this episode and thinking about just this whole topic, Something that was really helpful for me was to think about the ways in which I put myself into familiar roles. And because of that, the roles that I need the people around me to occupy in order for me to keep on playing the role that's familiar to me. And in order for us to keep on playing the roles that we're comfortable with, we often need the people around us to play certain kinds of roles themselves. And this can lead to a lot of patterns in our relationships. 
A common example of this might be a situation where a friend says to you, oh, everybody I date is a narcissist. You know, where are all of the not narcissists at? It's just so hard to find somebody who isn't profoundly self-absorbed these days. Now, there are a couple of possibilities here. First possibility is that they're right, and they're in a uh, unusually narcissist-rich environment, maybe because of the, the job that they're doing or the hobbies that they have or whatever. But the second possibility is that they are attracted to certain kinds of traits that are held by people who end up having those kinds of problems. Or maybe they're trying to put themselves over and over again into a certain kind of role in their relationships. And this requires them to find other people out in the world who will inhabit the roles that let them keep on playing the role that they like. And there are two ideas from psychology that I think really uh, intersect with everything that we were talking about during the conversation and were super helpful for me to learn about personally. And the first is the idea of enactments. And these are moments where a person relives a past relationship or a past interaction in the present. They act it out rather than describing it verbally. And this is a common feature that occurs in therapy where a client will come into the room and the relationship with the therapist will change in a way where they start to inhabit a role that is familiar to the client. So maybe this takes the form of the client just identifying it and saying, wow, you are kind of reminding me of my mother right now. Or maybe they just start interacting with the therapist as if they are their mother. And again, I'm not a clinician, but this is something that apparently is pretty common. And when it does happen, it gives the therapist an opportunity to recreate this interaction in a new light, or maybe unpack it with the client in a way that could support the client's growth over time. And then the second idea is triangulation, which comes from family systems theory. And the basic idea of it is that we tend to form triangles of relationship with other people, where there is sort of a powerful dyad that's allied against a weaker third party. And the example of this that Rick gave was Freud and his mother allied against his father. And you might be able to see how that could have potentially impacted a lot of his views about psychology that ended up getting passed down to people through his work and his writing. And one of the really interesting things for me about triangulation is how the relationship shifts over time, because it's not like there's always this just permanently powerful pair of people. Uh, that was a little difficult to say. I'm glad I could get that out, who are kind of allied against a weaker person. It shifts around. So let's say that those two people who are strong together get into some kind of an argument. Well, one of them then reaches out to the weaker third party and forms a new power relationship against the third person. And learning about this just really changed how I uh, viewed some of my social relationships and just kind of like watched other people's interactions with each other. It's a really interesting idea. And then toward the end of the conversation, Rick gave some practical advice about what we can do if we feel ourselves getting sucked into these kinds of unhealthy relationship structures where maybe somebody is starting to use us as that impromptu therapist, or they're triangulating with us against a third person, and we really don't want to be that to them, whatever it might be. And his advice really fell into two categories. The first category was to be really clear about what the other person wants from you and what your role is with them. Um, and this could include deliberately calling it out and going, hey, the last couple of times that we've talked, we've really focused on this problem. Is that really helpful for you? Is that what you want to be doing with me here? Or is that just kind of happening unconsciously? Like that's one thing that you could do. And his second recommendation was that you could get really practical about attempting to solve the problem itself not to solve the problem for the other person, but get real about, okay, you know, the last three times we've talked about this thing. And so what are your plans? Like, what do you want to do about this? Or do you just want to keep on talking about it? Because that's okay too. I know that for me, when I feel like I really understand the assignment, when I, when I understand what the other person actually is trying to get from me and really wants from me inside of the relationship, I feel so freed up inside of it, right? If I think that there is some kind of a covert desire or I feel like I'm getting pulled into something and it just starts to feel like quicksand, that's where things get really messy. But if you're clear about the role that you're playing for the other person and you're comfortable playing that role, well, that can be really okay. 
I really enjoyed this conversation today with Rick. I hope you did as well. And when it ended, we had a little conversation offline where we sort of went, huh, I wonder if other people are into conversations like this that are a little bit more psychology forward and maybe have a little bit more terminology. And we would love to hear from you. What are the episodes of the podcast that you really love? Do you like it when we have a guest? Do you like it when it's just the two of us? Do you like the episodes where we go into theory a little bit more, maybe like we did today? Do you like the episodes that are more focused on uh, mindfulness or contemplative practice? What are you into? And you can let us know at contact at beingwellpodcast.com. You can also comment on our various social media posts or support us through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. I read every message that we receive over there. I respond to almost all of them. So it's a fantastic way to get in touch. And hey, you'll also be supporting the show, which we, of course, enormously appreciate. And then finally, if you haven't done it already, but you are somehow here at the end of this podcast episode, and I would be surprised if both of those things are true, but hey, if you're listening and you haven't subscribed already, we'd really appreciate it. It really does help us out. So until next time, thanks for listening.